me share a little bit about the Agile Dirty. So this webinar session is uh, supported and sponsored by Agile Dirty, and we get a uh, we invited external speaker like Andre today to be part of uh, our community. So uh, we are going to be a community who help the uh, agile enthusiasts to connect global globally. So like Andre, he's from Romaine. So not only Malaysians, but we have uh, so many different uh, speakers and members from around the world. So also agile D is to boost the skill with our tailor for track mentorship like agile process and technicals and the product uh, development and also leadership. So we also uh, provide the top-notch uh, membership program with all the resources without breaking any bank. So, uh, and also as a community, we are beyond the certification and training. So let Agile Daddy to be your partner in your personal and your professional growth. And then uh, the next thing I want to share you guys is uh, please follow us so that you don't miss any uh, resource or updates or coming events. So we also available in a uh, link in, in uh, we call Agile Daddy in the group. And also we have the Facebook and also we have the Meetup platform. Uh, so this is the website we do have. So slowly we will have more and more resources available in the website. So feel free to follow us. And I think my, uh, some, my colleagues also will have to pay some link at the chat box. Feel free to make use of that. So that's it from my side. I will pass to you, Andre. Thank you. Um, and thank you everyone uh, for joining. Uh, thank you for opening your cameras. It was really nice to see you all. Um, I am planning to tell you about what's beyond Agile. And I hope we will be having an enjoyable session together. Feel free to comment, ask questions during the presentation that I will be doing. I am thinking of having a, maybe, I don't know, hopefully 30, 40, 50 minutes of presentation, uh, engaging presentation, dynamic presentation, so in which I will ask you to participate. Uh, and then we will also have a large portion at the end dedicated to Q&A. I don't have a crystal globe, so I'm not really sure what's beyond Agile and what's going to be next, but I will be telling you what I think uh, will come uh, beyond Agile and how maybe the next two, three, four, five years will look like. But the same, I'm really interested in your perspective. I'm interested in what you think. I'm interested in how you see the future unfolds. Um, a couple of things about me. My name is Andrei Gabrila. I live in Romania in Brasov, which is a mountain town. There's a lot of snow now in Brasov. Not a lot compared to, let's say, 10 years ago, but there is still there is still snow here. And um, I'm, uh, I was born here. I moved to Bucharest, which is our capital for my university. Then I've also moved to Paris. I'm glad to see he, people from Paris here. It was amazing while I was there. And now I'm back to my hometown, which is uh, Brasov, uh, Romania. I have around uh, 17 years of experience in creating software products. I started um, by being a .NET developer. And the first, let's say, eight to nine years, I was a developer. So I had various roles, team lead, technical lead, software developer, uh, but that's what I did. I was mostly writing code to create products uh, that were used by thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions of users. And then, which also coincided to the moment where I moved to Paris, I switched into, I would call them more leadership or management roles. So I started being a scrum master, uh, having uh, delivery management roles. Um, I prepared the mirror board for us just to, to, have, uh, to have some slides and until one minute ago, it didn't work. There was there was a downtime on, on the mirror side, but now we're back. Um, I, I hope it will stay with us like that. If not, no worries. I will try to maybe share a whiteboard and draw some of the things there. Not really good at drawing, but I will draw simple things just to make sure that uh, we will still uh, get to understand what, uh, what I mean. So I will share my screen and 
uh, I plan to I plan to cover today. Challenges when defining Agile. You will see why this is important. We will be speaking a little bit about uh, what Agile is and challenges when defining Agile. What does it mean to live in a post Agile world? What is beyond Agile for Agile coaches and Scrum Masters? What is beyond Agile for teams? What is beyond Agile for managers and executives? And the part of Q&A. So this would be our agenda for, for today. Um, I see that Miro is still having some problems and I see some, some, some small lags, but I hope it will be, it will be, it will be fine. Um, I think our time will be valuable if after our discussions here, we would be living with some answers and with twice as much questions. Why? Because I think by having questions, it will continue uh, the topic for us. So I'm, I, I'm not, I didn't bring all the answers to this talk. I don't have all the answers, that's for sure. Um, and I want you to know that I do think that we will be coming out of this discussion with questions. Uh, I think that's uh, super healthy. And I would also encourage you at the end to connect with me on LinkedIn. If you want us to continue this conversation, what is beyond Agile? What should we expect? I would love to do that. I would love to discuss with you one-on-one so we can schedule some time together. That would be really awesome. Couple of words about me. So I just said I have 17 years of experience, build a lot of products. Uh, some of them were used by millions of users. I worked for and with startups um, and the largest companies in the world. So the smallest company that I worked with had three people. The largest had at that moment 250,000 people. Now I think they reached 600,000 people. And I worked with a lot of companies in between, small, big, uh, at the start of their, let's say, life, company life, some of them already having success, um, some of them uh, being in a phase of, let's say, um, having products that might be in maintenance, trying to figure out what's next for them. Uh, as I said, around eight years, I was in technical roles, nine years in leadership roles, eight years I was working for product companies. So that means companies that were delivering the product themselves. And nine years I was working in outsourcing. And I call this the uh, I call this eight years in product and nine years in outsourcing a dual experience mode because it got me the chance to work to really understand how a company that focuses on the product works. But then the other years in outsourcing got me the chance to work with a multitude of companies, maybe not as in depth as for the product companies, but it got me the chance to experience a lot of context, to understand what works for a lot of companies, what doesn't work for a lot of companies. So um, I'm very proud of that. The fact that I have this dual experience mode, I think my experience is uh, interesting also because, uh, because of that. Uh, in the past two years, I focused a lot on consulting audits and due diligence. So I was working with company um, C-level executives uh, for in their quest to change their companies, to um, make it better, to seize the opportunities, to reduce the problems that they have, um, due diligence there, I'm not sure if you're familiar with this term, they are kind of audits that are done when one company looks at buying another company, not just that. So I have experience with that too, uh, understanding uh, and uh, evaluating companies from that point of view. And in the end, as I said, I'm a CTO, technical advisor, HR coach, and mentor. Uh, but enough about me, I would like us to discuss a little bit about uh, beyond Agile, and we will start with defining defining Agile. Um, I am tempted to <laughs> invite you to help me with Miro. So let's do that. I will share I will share this board with you because um, I need your help. Um, yeah, if it works, and I hope it it didn't freeze. Yeah, um, let's see. Maybe it was not necessarily the best uh, the best idea. That's fine. We will, uh, we will we will recover. Um, I'm interested in understanding what Agile is to you, and why why am I asking this question? Because, and depending on how each of us understand Agile, beyond Agile is different. 
So uh, I will not be doing that. I think it's a bit risky if we will connect, maybe things will be difficult. But if you want, it will be maybe um, uh, really useful if you can maybe use the chat in Zoom and tell us, share with us what Agile is to you. It's no context, no judgment. We are not here to get the best answer, but we are here to get your answer. And I will tell you why this is important in, in a minute. Um, so if you if you would like to share with us in chat what Agile is to you, it doesn't need to be sophisticated, just a couple of ideas um, what Agile is to you. So we have an answer on chat from Stefania, a mindset. Um, thank you. I'm also going to give you access to Miro uh, and You can edit here too. This is it. So if you want to, if you want to join this board and edit here, why not? If you want to continue to write in chat, that's that's fantastic. Also, uh, as you want. Excellent. So um, I I see I see some of you already had the chance to write. I'm going to read things quickly. So mindset is about delivering. Uh, frequently delivering value. That's really nice. Mindset of philosophy. Work fast, fail fast, deliver fast. Excellent. Ability. So it's an ability to adapt. Um, I'm going to bring everyone to me if you want to write on uh, Miro. Also, a way of working in projects, way of working, okay. Uh, deliver value incrementally. Uh, deliver a product incrementing, deliver value faster, faster time to market, iterative incremental. That's really amazing. Thank you. Um, in a way, that's also what I expected, that we will have a lot of answers around mindset and around producing value in a certain way for our customers. Uh, yeah, so great. You joined, uh, you joined the mirror board also. It seems it's working. Um, now, if you want, please continue to, to, to add things here. I will move forward to the next, uh, to the next slide here, which is there are actually two ways in which we can define Agile. And again, it's important for us to define Agile because in the way that we define Agile, beyond Agile will mean different things. Uh, and the, the two ways that we can define Agile is by going and looking at an authority-based definition, Usually that would be a dictionary, right? When I want to define a word, when I want to define a concept, I have good uh, probability that I will find the definition in a dictionary. So that, that would be one way. Um, another authority can be, uh, I don't know, maybe somebody who invented that word. Um, I'm not sure uh, if you know about this, Nevin, which is, um, uh, I would say, a way of uh, framework. Uh, that's an invented word. And, and if I would be to understand what Kinevin is, I will need to see who invented this framework and what does it mean to them. Uh, so in this case, the authority who defines what Kinevin is, is um, Dave Snowden, who published uh, this framework. So I was, I was telling you that there are two ways in which we can define it. One which is authority-based. So somebody will tell us what this word means. Um, and another is by looking at the common understanding. And um, we will look at both. Now, realistically, there is no authority who can tell us what Agile is. The founders of the Agile Manifesto didn't say specifically, Agile is that thing, that, that, that. When they created the Agile Manifesto, they spoke about values and principles. And they didn't try to define what Agile is. I think because it was at that moment, and it still is quite complicated to say what Agile is. And then we got to, a, let's say, a shared understanding of what Agile is based on the values, based on the principles, or based how we use that word uh, in what we do. Um, but as always, I went to an authority for helping us define stuff, which is in this case, Google, and I, and I searched for Agile. Uh, let's do that uh, together. You can still see my screen. My um my my full screen, right? You see also my tabs and uh, and everything, yeah. right? Yes. Okay. So if I search for AGL, you will see that these are some of the definitions. 
So we see it from here that Ajal is a methodology. Um, we see from here that Ajal is an ability. Uh, we see from here that Ajal software development refers to a, a group of methodologies. Uh, so this is what I try to capture here. Some of the things that I found on Google, uh, saying that Google is sometimes a source of authority um, and I took it here. So you see, there are some people that we say that it's an approach, a framework, a group of software development methodology, a way of working and a mindset, which most of us also agree with, looking by what you did, an approach. I think we had also some of the uh, ideas going towards approaching chat, a way, a group of practices and ability and methodology. That's a lot of things. Uh, Agile is a lot of things if we look at that list. And I said that that's what would be an answer to an authority-based definition. Um, but on, on the other hand, I also like to ask people that I work with, uh, what is Agile to them? So this is why I, I put this item here, Agile in common understanding. And there is like this show, I'm not sure you know this TV show, which is I've asked 100, I've asked 100 people, not sure if you, if you know this show, um, asking 100 people what something is, but I kind of play this game with people. So I'm going to them, I'm asking them, what is Agile to you? Uh, and I managed to ask maybe, I don't know, hundreds, tens, tens of people, hundreds of people. Um, and I would want you to help me to tell me how you think these three groups of people are mapped with these three answers. So consider here that I've asked 100 people. It's a bit less than 100 people. That's a group. That's another group of 100 people. That's another group of 100 people. And consider these three groups and try to tell me what your intuition says. So which one of these groups here map to these three groups here. So as you can see, I've asked 100 Agile coaches what Agile is, and they said one of these three options. I've asked 100 executives VP what Agile is, and they said one of these three options. And I asked 100 team members what Agile is, and they said one of these three options. So please, uh, if you want, just unmute yourself, uh, try to take a guess. Which group is which? Selecting. Arya, sorry, I'm, I I didn't get what you mean. What you said? Uh, uh, Selectory, I was just asking. Can I answer? Uh, I was just yeah, asking. sure, sure. Go ahead. Okay, so the first uh, hundred people are uh, agile coaches and scrum masters. Okay, and then executive and uh, directors is the second okay and the team members are the last uh... okay that's good you got you got one right and uh two two wrong but thank you that, that's excellent who, who else wants to maybe uh tell us what they think which which one uh, here might be right and which one might be uh, might be might be different I want to try. Um, I think the swap is between the executive and the team member is swapped to each other. Yes. Okay. Yes. That, that's that's the that's the right answer. Um, again, it, it doesn't mean that the, that's what the Agile is. But every time I speak with Scrum Master and coaches, a lot of them will say that Agile is a mindset. They will tell me that it's based on values or principles. They will tell things around the way of working, uh, maybe some of the practices. Uh, some of them will, will define it by processes or frameworks. So for example, they will tell me about Scrum or SAFE. When I ask team members, you see here actually grouped methodology and process because for a lot of people that work in teams, developers, QA, UI UX designers, or people in marketing that I've been being a scrum master for, they would say that Agile is a methodology or a process. So something that is done in a, in, a, in a way. And when I ask executives, VP directors, and by the way, here also 
PM's PO, they kind of go into that kind of answer. They speak about Agile as a capability, most of them, as a process. So around Scrum and SAFE, also some of them, a way of, uh, of, of working, but very processualized. Uh, and some of them speak about practices like uh, stand-ups or, uh, I don't know, CICD or something like that. So, well, again, why am I sharing these statistics to you? Because depending what Agile is, beyond Agile is something different. So when executives ask me, uh, so Andre, what do you think is beyond Agile? What should I do next? They are not asking me about what do you think is beyond Agile from a mindset point of view. For them, the question is, what capability should I build in my company? What capability, what ability to do stuff should I build in my company? When I speak with team members and they say, what is beyond Agile? For them, the question is, how will I work tomorrow? How will I get requirements? How often do I need to deploy? How often do I need to collaborate with people? Um, who will I work with? What will be the process for me? And when I speak with Asia, with Asia coaches and Scrum Master, uh, the, the, for them, beyond Asia, this question is around what is the way we will be working in the future, but not process, not necessarily around process, and also this question that I see more and more, especially in the past year, what is happening with my role? What will happen to my role? So these are the kind of things. And this is why I try to break down the what is beyond Asia in the scope of this presentation, grouped around that, around those questions. Make sense? Okay, excellent. So now we will be going and, and discussing a little bit about living in a post-Agile world. Maybe you've heard this concept of post something. So because of that, tell me, what do you think smartphones, refrigerators, or let's say even pens, like pens, like writing pens and Agile have in common? You can unmute yourself. Uh, uh, answer no problem. I think we we are in a in a small group, and the risk that we speak over each other is really, is actually small. So, what do you think smartphone pens refrigerators have in common in Asia? Most widely used in every home or every individual has it. Um, I would say uh, help us reach up some objectives. Right. Okay, Ariana. I actually I didn't hear you too well. I think you are a bit far from the microphone, and it, there is like a. Uh, a background um, um, somehow noise that um, it doesn't make your voice clear. Can you repeat, please? It's most widely used by every individual. Yes, that, that, that's one. Most widely used. Uh, I understood now, most widely used. Um, uh, they uh, wide. How do we write widely? Uh, most widely used. Uh, they, help, they help us uh, reach a goal. Thank you, Alexandra. Yes, what else? Possible. Different manufacturer. Created by people. Excellent. It's a tools. Different manufacturers. It's really great. And they are tools. Yeah, fantastic, fantastic. So you're right. All of these things are here. So they are things that are created by people. All of them are widely used. So now if you want to write something on paper, you will be probably using a pen, a type of pen, a ballpoint point pen, for example. We all use them. If you want to speak with somebody on the distance, you will be probably using a smartphone. Of course, you might be using, a, you might be using your laptop, but when you really want to call somebody, most of the time, use a smartphone. They do help us to reach a goal and they are tools. So it's kind of like the same for Agile, that now when you try to do something, for example, especially in the software industry, when you try to organize, when you try to group your enterprise, when you try to deliver value, you will be going towards Agile. 
When you try to write something, you will be going towards pen. When you try to call somebody, you will be uh, using smartphones. So this is what this post here, it's all about. We could say that we live in a post pen world. So when we are writing, we are all using pens. We can also say that we live in a post smartphone world because when we are calling we all have a we all have a smartphone and the question that we can ask ourselves do we live in a post agile world um now post also means that it's kind of over right that so for some of us when we say post it means okay it's done it's finished but in in the english language when we say that that we live in a post smartphone world it means Everybody has a smartphone, but the next technology, we don't know what that is. So it has this connotation that we don't know what that is. The same for writing. Uh, we all have pens, but how we will write tomorrow, what kind of other technologies we will be using, we don't know. Because the technology is not there, is not clear. So the question that I wanted to ask you is, do you feel that we live in a post-Agile world? Um, there is this uh, um, Agile state, uh, state of Agile survey that says that 97% of respondents say that their organization practice Agile development methods. And as you will see here, uh, a lot of them are actually practicing it for five or three to five, five plus years. So the answer, in my opinion, is yes, we live in a post-Agile world. All the companies in the world, they want to be Agile, they speak about agility, uh, uh, they they make that uh, their uh, one of their most important goals. And I was also telling you that I'm doing due diligence and audits, and that's a question that I get to hear from investors often. How agile is that company? How do you know? How do we know? And I didn't do due diligence five years ago to 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 say if that was the question, but I don't think that investors used to ask that question five or 10 years. Now they are asking it, even if they don't really understand it other than what we said here, that to them, agility is a capability to adapt somehow. So well, the answer is, in my opinion, yes, we live in a post agile world and that uh, has uh, two, two, two implications. The first implication is that agile cannot be a competitive advantage just by being Agile or by doing Agile will not make you different. Everybody's doing it. Well, some of us are doing it better. Some of us are doing it worse. So because of that, we will be different. But just by doing it, if you look at it as a process or just by being it, it will not make you different. It needs to be more than that. Um, and that's one of the questions, one of the one of the reasons why people come to me and ask me, Andre, what's beyond Agile? Because I can understand that it cannot, it can no longer be a competitive advantage for me, for my company. This is why, as I said, executives ask me that question. Because to them, it's becoming more and more obvious that Agile is no longer a competitive advantage. But as I said, in the case of just being or doing, if you are doing it right, then that, that's a competitive advantage for sure. Uh, and the second implication is because everybody's doing it, we started looking differently at Asia. Why? Because of these performance implications. And let me tell you why. When we do, when, when everybody is agile or doing agile, again, I'm, I'm being really careful about these words. I know a lot of us uh, being agile coaches or scrum masters, we are really fond of saying you have to be agile and not do agile but that's not the reality in the industry because at least two other groups they consider that we have to do agile that's what they answer um, be because of that because everybody is being and doing agile we have an interesting situation top performance are doing it middle performance are doing it low performance are doing it. And when I say top, middle, and low performance, I speak about companies. I'm speaking about companies that are having top results, middle results, bottom results. And 
uh, I don't know if if that's it's the, if that's of any value to you, but it should be because it's again it's linked to that that is no longer a competitive advantage, but also it's linked to the fact that we have a lot of middle and low performers in the agile game. And that has implication on how the industry is seeing Asia because they are associating that with the results that we are getting. And I do hear from some of the companies that I work with, not just that Asia is not a competitive advantage, that it's not good enough. That is bad. That is not working out. That is not helping out. Again, because Asia is so linked with what how we are doing things in, and with with the results, and I also want to to tell you that a lot of us, when we think about results, we look at this Gauss curve, uh, and this Gauss curve says that if you take a population, any population like human beings, and you try to find out something about them, their IQ, it will mean that we have an average in the human population, and fifty percent of them are above average. And 50% of them are below average. So in a way, 50% have a bigger IQ, 50% have a lower IQ than the average, right? So let's say that if you are here, it means you have um, an IQ that's higher than the average. Now, again, if you are a company and you are here, it means that your results, your performance, your company performance, the way that you deliver value, uh, the return on investment, uh, the happiness of your imp employees, uh, the engagement of your customers, it depends what results mean to you, is you are, and you will probably see that you are better than the average. That's when you are here somehow. So whatever you are when, when, when as a company or as a person, you see that in a way or another you are, are better than the average. And a lot of us consider that performance is in this kind of distribution. But the truth is that we have good information that it isn't. That actually performance doesn't look like that, but performance looks like that, which is something that is called the power law distribution. I will not enter into details because it's not the purpose of my uh, talk here. We, we, we are still speaking about beyond age. But what I want to say is that if you will distribute the companies, not people, but companies on a performance scale, you will see that there are some companies that are really top performers that are delivering value, again, whatever value is to them in a very, very um, uh, incredible way. And then there are a lot of other companies that if I would draw the average, this would be the average, which is probably 80% of them that are that, that are below that average point. So think about that implication. 80% of companies out there are probably in terms of getting results below the average of all the companies in the world. And that's fine. I mean, it, it's, it's not a problem. It doesn't make the companies bad or it doesn't make the companies, um, uh, I don't know, um, in, in, in risk. That's, that's how we distribute in terms of performance. Um, and a lot of these companies that now are, all of them are doing Agile, they started to associate Agile and whatever their understanding of Agile is with the fact that they are not above this average line. And that's that's a normal, natural implication to the fact that we live in a post-Agile world. So I was saying that because you'll probably hear in the next years, we will hear more and more about that 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 thing. Agile is not helping me out. Agile is not providing an, a competitive advantage. Agile is not working out for me. Agile is no longer a differentiator for me. And we will not be hearing that from a few companies. We will be hearing that from a lot of companies. And a lot of companies will be looking at what's next. What do I do next? Again, because of that. We don't have the time to discuss that in detail. It's something that I, I, I've spent a lot of time looking at the uh, statistic distribution of performance, the psychology of performance, uh, excellency, and all of that. And I was telling you that if you want us to dig deeper into that, please don't hesitate to write uh, on 
uh, LinkedIn. It's an interesting subject, but what I try to say here is that, in my opinion, we will hear more and more companies saying Agile is not right for them because of the fact that that's how performance is distributed and because of the fact that we are all uh, doing Agile. And it shouldn't concern us too much because, I mean, that's not scary. It's just an opportunity to see the future. It's just an opportunity to create it. We will need to adapt to that. We will need to be going in uh, in, a, in a different direction than what we want. We will probably need to adapt the way that we speak. We will probably need to invent other ways of remaining in this way of adaptability, but it might just probably be that we might be speaking less and less about, let's say, Scrum, SAFE, or Agile in, in a way. So that's just a prediction that I have. Um, and I, I don't think it will, um, it should scare us, but it, we should be looking at what should that mean to me? How would the landscape change uh, in the following five to, to 10 years? Um, and Questions? Please. Questions. Okay, so what you are sharing right now, assuming that all these groups are already using Agile, but if the people, the company is not using Agile, maybe they will still, they will still want more because they, they're not using Agile. They are competing with people using Agile who are giving value faster. Of course, they are getting, they are not getting better. But if you were to compare this data among all those people, Agile, yes, we want more. I don't think it's sufficient enough. But if you were to compare with those companies who doesn't use Agile, they may still need to use Agile. They won't be saying, that, oh, it doesn't work for me because they don't even try, isn't it? Yes. Okay. Yeah. And to summarize, Companies that are non-agile and they are going towards agility, they will get benefits uh, uh, compared to, to the past. And this is why um, I, I, I don't want to, to talk too much about frameworks. This is why in the case studies of SAFE, which is, I'm not, I'm not a big fan of SAFE. I'm not a big detractor of SAFE. So I'm not, um, I, I don't have, let's say, too many things against SAFE uh, in the, uh, case studies of SAFE, they do manage to prove that, not sure that always, but companies that pass to that, that are coming from a non-Agile, very, let's say, waterfall Polish way of looking at things, just by installing SAFE, they do, do have benefits. Uh, yeah. So I think that is something that indeed it proves that when, when you're completely unaware of this Agile world and you do any steps toward the Agile world, you will be getting benefits. But the benefits... Today, is, it will bring you maybe from low performance to just a little better performer. It will no longer bring you from a low performer to, wow, just because I'm doing that, uh, I, I, I went there to the top, to the best and the top of the performance. That's the kind of jump that you can make. Um, and you see between that and that, the difference is not that big. It's 20% better, 30% better, some better but we're not it will not it will no longer be a competitive advantage that was a very good point um uh, thank you for uh, thank you for sharing um and so um because of that I, I just i do want to tell a couple of things about how i do see uh, beyond more than more than that uh, but that's let's keep that in mind that in my opinion uh, we will be looking at differentiators companies will be looking at differentiators uh, and more and more executives will will no longer uh, be open to the talk. Let's do a, let's say, agile transformation because uh, to them, they will see that there are so many companies doing that and they are not top of the, um, top, top of the, I mean, the best in performance. So for, um, uh, for that to continue, I wanted to tell you that beyond agile, uh, I split it into uh, four, four, three parts. Um, this one will be probably um, uh, an introduction for a, a next webinar that I would like to do here at Agile 30, if we, uh, you will invite me again, uh, because it's a big topic. Um, but let's look quickly. So for Agile coaches, what is beyond? Remember the Agile coaches say that Agile is a mindset, is an, it's a way of working. Uh, um, and I wanted to share this with you. Uh, it's a graph that says that from a mindset point of view, there are two ways in which we work, adaptive and predictive. 
And starting from the 60s, we were working very adaptive. And then in the 70s and 90s, which is also called the Waterford era, we were very predictive. And then we went back to this zone of adaptability once the Asia Manifesto was signed. So from a mindset point of view there, we don't have a lot of options. We are either predictive or we are adaptive. The beyond AGL from that point of view, it doesn't even make a sense what's, what's beyond the mindset. Uh, so my prediction here is that we will be working somewhere around the adaptive zone with a bit more predictability in the future. This is what uh, we see more and more, but we will probably not leave this area of actually adaptive or agile uh, in the future. So there is not much from the mindset point of view. And even if you look at the evolutions uh, that, uh, that are happening, and um, uh, here we have um, uh, the heart of agile from Alistair Coburn. Here we have modern agile from um, um, I forgot uh, uh, his his name, um, but it's re really cool, a really cool iteration on agility or agile too. Most of the things from a mindset point of view are just about an evolution of values, a better understanding of values. So here, I don't have a lot of predictions. I do think that in terms of mindset, in terms of, uh, of, of the approach of the values, there wouldn't be much change. But I also want to tell you a little bit about what's my role going, because I do have a lot of conversation with agile coaches and scrum masters about that. So what's what's for me, what's in store for me? Um, and here's what I see. I see a decline in this role. I see less job openings for agile coaches and scrum masters. Now, we also have a, 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 a not that great period in the industry overall. So I'm not just going to take the past year for that, but I do see a decline in the number of roles for agile coaches and scrum masters. And again, that's not something to worry us too little because it's not in a way that things are disappearing. The right question to ask is, what are these roles transforming into? So the question for me as an agile coach is what will I do in maybe five to 10 years is how will I be continuing? Not that, okay, I will maybe in a way um, uh, not have that role anymore. But the question is, how will I transform the current role that, that I have? And <clears throat> I put this, which is the Agile Competency Framework. It says that an Agile coach should be a teacher, uh, a mentor, a coach, a facilitator, should have technical mastery, transformation mastery, business mastery, and of course, should be an agile lean practitioner. So have the mindset and be able to practice it. And I'm seeing more and more people that are going from these roles into, let's say, more leadership managerial roles. I see more and more agile coachings that are coaches that are taking management roles. And in the way that they are implementing these management roles is that they are keeping the philosophy, the core of agile coaching at the root of everything that they do. But they are better situated to modify, to change, to support the companies in which they are. I think one of the biggest problems of the agile coach role for the past maybe five years is the fact that we don't have enough power to implement the changes that companies need. Why? Because managers, they do have the power and, and we always nurture this relationship. We need to influence them. We need to build relationships so that we can influence them. And this is why in a lot of places, you will see that there is like this match between what, what Asia coaches say and what, what we are able to do also because we speak different language. Why? Because when we, when we go into companies, we at Agile coaches come and say, we need to install the mindset. Everybody needs to think in a new way. While managers, they keep on asking, what's the capability that we are building? What can we build? What do we need to build in the company? And because we speak different languages, it becomes, it becomes different, difficult to, in a way, go together in, in, in the same direction. If you want 
in my opinion, the best slide that I have for you is that one. And please try to think more about that. What does it mean to you that you speak a different language than members of your team? What does it mean to you that you speak a different language than the executives in your company? And what what's the implication of that somehow? So what I'm what I said here is that I feel that more and more HR coaches will be evaluating them going into companies as managers and keeping that mindset, the values and the principles at the root of what they do. This is my prediction for the future, uh, that we will be seeing more and more people that are going into more, let's say, decision-oriented roles. And I think that's great because every time that I work with a manager or an executive that has agile, agile coaching as a foundation, I, it's not that it's not that we just speak the same language, but you can see how that company is different from other companies that, that didn't get there yet. You can you can see the context, you can see it in the results, you can see it in how engaged uh, people are, you can see it in um, in a lot of things. So uh, where is my role going? My prediction more into management. Uh, Think if that's for you, uh, and yeah, think about about embracing that. Um, and now I will say a little bit about what's next in my opinion for teams and managers. And I consolidated this into uh, one uh, one answer because for both from, from in my opinion for both of these roles it will be the same uh, it will be the same answer. So let's look again on what 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 these roles answer. So. Team members say that Agile is a methodology, a process. For them is, when do I do work? How do I do work? What will it happen? And executives, they say Agile is a capability, right? So they would say, what do I need to have in my organization processes? What capabilities do I need to build? That's that's the answer. And in here, um, I will tell you how I see um, transformation in the industry now. And actually, when transformation happens, I, I'm not a big fan of the word transformation, but again, I think it says kind of like the same thing for all of us. Um, companies will con are in a constant transformation. They will continue to do a transformation for the entire life. And the word transformation kind of says that we will finish the transformation at some point. But in the way that companies approach those transformation, um, um, they approach it having these, let's say, three domains in mind. One is culture or mindset, exactly what we said about HR coaches. Another one is practices process, so what we said the team members have. And the third one is governance structure, which actually is quite close to the abilities uh, and the capabilities that we what, what that we said. But that's how the industry is approaching transformation in HR. I'm not sure if, if that matches with you. But that's how it's done. So most of the transformations, they are around the process practice framework. Most of them come and say, we will be installing SAFE into our enterprise. Most of us say, we will be putting Scrum in all of our teams. And because we put Scrum, that's how we are going to create requirements. That's how we are going to deploy work. This is how we are going to approve work. This is who will approve work. This is who will approve uh, things done. This is when we will work with our customer, etc. So that's a very practices process framework orientation. You see, I'm using here the the words interchangeably, although they aren't, just to give you an idea. So this is the word of, as I said, let's install safe, let's put in place Scrum, um, let's arrange our companies around a process, a large, a small, a big process. Um, if you look at Scrum, you will see that the depiction of Scrum is of a process. If you look at SAFE, you will see that SAFE has, a, uh, uh, as I said, a very process orientation uh, way. But what do they also have? A culture. They speak about the culture, they speak about the mindset. And they say, um, wouldn't it be great if all the people in our company would just 
start to be closer to the customer. That's the trace of, of mindset issue. Would it, wouldn't it be nice if all of us, we will be um, working, uh, let's say weekly with our customers. Wouldn't it be nice if everybody in the company would be improving from, from time and time, maybe every two weeks. That's that's how, how, how let's say, let's say cultural or mindset transformation uh, approach. And the reality is, again, when I say reality, I speak about my experience is that most of these transformation have very big limitations. Why? Because practices can only bring you that far. And practices are more like creating boxes. That's how we work. That's what we need to respect. And they are not really taking into account how we humans work, and especially this idea of complex adaptive system. And culture, which would be great if it, it would work, cultural transformation are very hard to do. And you cannot do cultural transformation no matter how smart you are, no matter how empathetic you are, no matter how, how big your transformation team is, but in years, years and years, culture changes in years and years. So if your company has a certain culture and you want to change it, you will probably change it if you do a concentrated effort for years. And this is why, in my opinion, a lot, and not just mine, I think there are other people that speak about that. A lot of these transformations, they have bad rates in terms of achieving results. And people aren't always happy because we put in place processes and culture. Now, we in Pentalog, we have been doing that also for some time now. And we learned from that. And how do we approach the transformation in Pentalog? And this, again, answers to the question beyond Agile, how will Agile be in a way implementing and done from my point of view in the next three to five years, more and more. We in Pentalog, we approach it, we, we respect practices and processes, we respect culture, but we look a lot at that, structure or governance. And uh, the answer to that question, what is beyond Agile to me is a lot around governance and culture. Now, governance might have, let's say, a, um, for some of you, it might have um, a bad reputation as a word. Uh, it could be governance, it could be structure. Uh, but let me tell you what, what I mean by, by governance. I will try to tell you that um, here is how we approach here is how we approach um, sorry about that. Here is how we approach. I'll, I'll just take an example, which is the backlog, the product backlog. Here's how we approach, let's say, implementing product backlogs in companies that they aren't using uh, product backlogs from these three points of view: governance, culture, and practice. The first way that we would approach product backlog is inside of a process. So we would be saying, I'm going to install Scrum. We all need a product backlog. Uh, a product backlog is going to be the one that we put work to do. And during Scrum, we will be taking work out of the product backlog, putting it in a sprint backlog and working on that and delivering that. And that is a very process way into, trans, into let's say, putting in, in, in place one practice around agility. I try to simplify it. We look at the practice because I would like you to understand how we would approach product backlog from these three point of views. And a lot of companies, as I said, they approach backlogs like that. They say, so we need a backlog. Here is who will own it. Here is how we put things in. And here is what we are going to do. And in a lot of companies, you will see things like that. When an initiative comes, we will review it in a portfolio committee and compute expected return on investment, a main business case and delivery approach. If the expected ROI is above 76.7, this is a fake number, right? Then we will be putting the initiative, uh, we will be start documenting the architectural use cases. This will include the, 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 the if it's not before that, we will be putting that into another thing. This is what, as I said, process looks like. And this is what transformation that have process at the core they look like. And again, I see a lot of companies that they do that <laughs> in the uh, idea that processes will save us. Um, 
from a mindset point of view, it's that. From a mindset point, point of view, people say, we need a backlog that will cap capture the value uh, from our customers. Value should be the most important thing. Again, a good ideas. From a governance point of view, when we would be implementing a backlog, we would be looking at rules. Here are some of the rules that we can have around the backlog. That it is owned by a single person who has the power to change it. That it is ordered based on return on investment. So we do that, but we don't tell people how. We say our backlog should be governed by these rules, that it is ordered based on ROI. But as a company, I'm not going to define how you do that or way of ordering. That it will no longer have than 150 items and that the cycle time in a backlog will be uh, less than 25 days. So these are just examples on how we would approach that. Maybe I was a bit, uh, I, maybe I was a bit in a rush here, but what I wanted to tell you is that anything, a large agile transformation or a small thing, which might be how we handle a product backlog can be approached from these three perspectives, practices, culture, and governance. Today, our transformation, they go into a lot of practices or processes, some culture, and very little governance. And this is why, in my opinion, and again, in our opinion in Pentalo, we, we see limited impact of this transformation. On the other hand, if you start approaching it with some practices and process, with some culture, but with a lot of governance, which means making these kind of rules and understanding how they are applied in your company, which is what governance in a way is, and how efficient we are in applying them, we see different kinds of transformations, which are much more successful than, um, than, uh, than before. And, um, Again, that, that could be, um, 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 or let's say, a team for one of our next uh, webinars, if you would like us to get into depth by that. Just wanted to show you that in Pentalog, we do try to capture some of these rules into what we call maturity model. And we use this maturity model to look at companies from this point of view. Are they in an immediate risk or obvious risk of failure? Um, are they uh, in a state of wasting resources? Uh, are these companies in a state of efficient and effective way? Uh, are they innovative and do they perform as competitive advantage? Because these rules here, they are grouped around that. There are some of the rules here that are around, these are the basic of the basic that we need to respect. And then there are some rules that say, if we will be respecting that, and if we manage to get there, we'll be having competitive advantage, we'll be there in a way much better than our competition. The topic today was beyond Agile. And I wanted to uh, tell you that um, ever since we uh, did this way of looking at Agile uh, and on efficiency, on how we want to work, um, we see uh, something, um, this is just, I, I try to create one of the reports that we are using in Pentalog. Um, and in here, you will see that that's risk. That's a lot of risk. And that's very little risk. Um, and these are projects or let's say collaboration, customer collaboration. And this is like the, the, the let's say the, the, the structure score that, that, that I was telling you about. And we said that when we will be doing, we will be starting to look differently at these things rather than implementing processes, but looking at, at governance, uh, we will be seeing that. Collaboration that have really good structure will not be in risks. And we do see that. And collaborations that are in poor structure, they will be in high risk. And I couldn't, of course, show you the report from, from my company uh, because it contains client names and, and all of that kind of things. But I try to duplicate it here 
And we look at this report again and again and again, and it tells us that this approach that we have, focusing on something that's governance and not on something that's process, is working out. Um, so that's it. That's that's kind of what I wanted to tell you. And I just want to summarize this to go quickly and to summarize so that we we understand what I what I was trying to share. And we have more than twenty minutes to exchange afterwards. I wanted to tell you that. <clears throat> different groups of people understand what Agile is differently. So if you want to have a conversation with them about what's beyond Agile, you have to first understand what Agility is to them. Um, mindset is something that Agile coaches and Scrum Masters do. People that work in Agile and let's say decision makers don't look at it like that. People that work in Agile see it more as a process, People that decide see it more as capabilities, ability to do stuff. Uh, in my opinion, the sooner that we do this switch and we start speaking the same language, and the switch should be done like that, not like that, so not like that, you will already start seeing results in your company. The second thing is that everybody's doing agile. And because of how performance is done, most of companies doing Agile, 80% of them, they are not really great at it. Because of that, we are seeing less and less people excited by the idea of Agile and Agility. The third thing is, in my opinion, in terms of mindset, nothing will change. We as Agile coaches, will still be looking at how do we how can we help companies understand that how can we sustain this mindset and the fourth idea is in terms of what other groups see as agile as practices and culture we see a shift more and more for something which is let's implement a process into something which is how do i put the best rules in place so that my company succeeds. And this is super good news because this is also really, really close related to what executives want, which is capabilities. So Beyond Agile is still about Agile because there's nothing on the horizon yet. But the next wave of, let's say, agility that will be coming in the next years, two to three to four years, will be looking less and less at practices and also at culture because that reached its limitation and we'll be looking more at governance at how do I put in place this kind of adaptable, simple, easy to use rules so that I understand where I need to go with my company. And we can speak more on that. Thank you very much for um, uh, watching this uh, presentation. Um, I'm sure that you have a lot of questions. Uh, I'm glad that we will be looking, living with questions. And again, that's uh, uh, I'm reaching out to you by saying that I'm super open to discuss the questions that you have also in one-on-one -on -one situation. Just feel free to reach me on uh, LinkedIn. So now uh, we have uh, around 20 minutes for um, know, getting into depth on some of the points, uh, some of the questions that uh, you, you might have. Yeah, Ingrid, please go ahead. Hi, um, thanks for the presentation uh, first. And then my question is uh, how to move from a process uh, to, to a government governance uh, capabilities because we we see that people are, uh, are have difficulties to 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 go out of that processes that uh, make them confident of uh, things to be um, um, how do we say that uh, uh, in uh, control uh, uh, yeah in control thank you in control and constraint yeah um, yeah. Uh, yeah, excellent question. So this is one of the reasons why 
process one over mindset. When you start speaking about mindset, it makes people in control worried. How do I measure mindset? How do I control it? How do I box it? How do I know where we are? Super difficult to do. So that's why they said, let's go process because process I know. I know process, I've done processes my entire life. I can measure process, I can measure process efficiency. I can do that. And this is why SAFE speaks so much to, to big enterprises that they are, they are process oriented. The advantage of governance is that as you saw, governance looks like rules. Governance looks like rules saying, I want all the teams in my company to be cross-functional. This is something that we know from Scrum that is desired, but a lot of Scrum implementations don't have that. Why? Because a lot of Scrum implementation focus on the process, to do a planning, to do a retro, to put items in the backlog. But the core of Scrum is having a cross-functional team. A lot of the companies forget about that. But in the governance transformation, in the governance ways of looking at things, in a company you would say, how about we define this rule? that all of our teams are cross-functional. Now, we will let them tell us if they are or not cross-functional. We are not going to define a process on how to measure cross-functionality, but we will constantly go in, we will be constantly going to the teams and ask them, are you cross-functional? What's left? What do you need? How can we help you? And that speaks to people that you know, we need to remain in control managers, executives, directors. The switch is let's focus less on processes. Let's focus more on respecting these rules. And some of these rules are quite easy to implement and they are mathematic. They are easy to measure. So the answer to the question, Ingrid, is that compared to mindsets that are not really measurable, this governance focus is still measurable and still giving deciders, executives, directors, the confidence that they remain in control. And that's one of its biggest advantage, but it's focusing on the right things rather than on processes. So the way that I do it, I go and I tell them about that. I go and I tell them that, look, we will be trying to define some of these rules together. You will be defining rules for your company because you know your company best. I will be helping you put in place some of the other rules because I know I have that this experience. And then we will end up with a set of rules, not too many, because we don't want to have too many rules. But then once we have these rules, we will try more and more and more to respect them. So we will start with a company that maybe has 20% of their team cross-functional, and we will set a plan that in the six months time, we will have 80% of teams cross-functional. We will not set the goal that all the companies will be doing Scrum. That's also a governance rule. We will set the goal that all the teams will be cross-functional. Okay, and maybe we will be doing Scrum. But it's that switch from process to governance. I, I hope this helps. Yes, clear. Thanks. Andre, I would like also to tell you something. Uh, I'm glad that you made this presentation, it's very nice as always <laughs> and uh, for me uh, a lot of things um, happen in uh, the culture area and i think that uh, this area is nurtured by uh, the transformation that you mentioned with governance and uh, the mindset is also a brick in this um, a structure and culture could get bigger if the governance is, is done good. And um, I think that um, uh, this should also be a point to reflect on, uh, to have the culture also get bigger because um, in this case, the people would be more aware of the benefits. And uh, I think that this could be done uh, uh, also by governance and uh, nurturing uh, this mindset of people and um, by seeing the good results that we have through through this transformation you mentioned. It's a super good point. Yes, indeed. 
these circles they actually influence each other. Um, yeah. And as 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 I I I put that in, in that slide, I'm trying to say that an, a healthy approach should be focused on culture, practices, and governance, but probably two times more on governance than the other two. And that's what we see today in the industry, where it's nine times more process than anything else. That's, in my opinion, that's an unhealthy ratio, that nine to one. But you're right. And also what you said is, is true, that once you know how to choose these rules, and once you know how to go towards these rules, everything else will kind of flourish, including culture. Um, but again, if you choose the right rules, right? If one of these rules is, for example, um, I don't know, making sure that all of our teams are engaged and motivated and finding your way, your local way to measure that and to, to implement that, your culture will evolve in, in, the, in the right direction. So, yeah, I think, I think you, you are 100% right. They, they do. And I, I hope nobody here got the impression that culture is, is, is not important. It is. Uh, and it will um, be better uh, if you know on what to focus and not focus on culture itself. <laughs> yes, and another thing I wanted to ask you, maybe you saw it uh, LinkedIn, I think, uh, trend or some people are attracted to, to this, even articles on Medium and stuff. It's a Cliff Berg. Uh, I don't know if you saw his post. He's uh, telling that really almost, Berg, uh, yeah. Agile is dead. Uh, <laughs> things like that. So people kind of imagine that, uh, okay, we will reach one point uh, when this will over and another era will come with maybe other <laughs> stuff to do or frameworks or uh, mindset or something else. <laughs> Yeah, you're right. And, and there are these talks. And again, we need to think, what does this person mean when they say agile? Because they would definitely mean something else than if it would have been an executive saying agile is dead. Yeah. Uh, in, in a way. But by the way, Cliff is one of the authors of Agile 2 that I put there as a slide. And when he says agile is dead, he also says, yeah, but I have a new solution for you, which is agile 2, <laughs> my iteration on agile. Yes, so, agile 2. Yeah. yeah, we need to take that with a grain of salt, right? <laughs> <laughs> yes, in fact, Agile is not that, but uh, in fact, practice is uh, more, I think, that what you also meant, that uh, of doing things by the book and not going beyond or out of the box or something. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, personally, I don't think that uh, we need to give up to, to this, and I think that for the people when it really works, it's nice to go on and keep uh, keep the the way. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Thank you. Let's go to Wahiza. I'm, I hope I'm saying your first name right. Yeah. Correct. Um, okay, uh, I've got two questions. The first one is on the one of your chart on the mindset. You put in there that we are seeing the trend of uh, adaptive, if I read it correctly. Uh, you're showing that it is adaptive mindset. We are going through that era instead of predictive, like very fixed mindset. But what you're seeing right now is more like after all your explanations and showing that uh, the management, they are nervous when they don't know much thing. They want to be in control. So that's why we give them the governance. We get them to give decisions. So it's like it's more going back to the predictive instead of adaptive. That's what I'm seeing. But your chart is showing adaptive. That's a very good point, yeah. Okay, that's the first and, one. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. I've got two the, questions. So that was the first one first. Maybe you can yeah, clear that for me. Clear that. Mm -hmm. Um. You you said you, you said it right that in a way we are going towards a, a more predictive, um, let's say state, mm. just as we see here, uh, that kind of like oh sorry <laughs> it was too much <laughs> too much deep. Um, we kind of see it here that indeed it feels like the curve goes like that, starting to go there, but towards more predictive it doesn't mean here. Just saying that we're probably going to look like that. And stabilize somehow 
in a way, at least for a while. But yeah, that's that's the thing. And, and in my opinion, um, we are currently in a process of stabilizing like this through a lot of processes. So I do see that. And I do hope that we will be stabilizing like this through governance, which is a much better way to stabilize and to, 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 to have more predictability than processes. But I don't think we will ever pass this middle line, right? So we will always be, sorry, in a more on, on an adaptive mindset than a predictive mindset in software development. Um, and that's because the world is pushing us through all of the changes that are passing words, uh, inflation, uh, everything is changing all the time. So, but yeah, you're you're right. And that's that's what I was kind of trying to say. But definitely don't get it as we are going back to waterfall, uh, full predictability, no adaptability. But getting back to the management, they want to be doing the, the governance, they want to be in control, it's more back to predictive. It is, it is, but not fully predictive. So a lot of executives that I speak with, they understand that their company needs to be adaptable more than anything. And they see it as a capability. So the question is, what do I need to build in my company so that I'm more adaptable? Some of them are trying to look at budget. Some of them are trying to look on um, outsourcing or not. Some of them are trying, are trying a lot of stuff, not around the mindset, not around the process, but around capabilities. Should I um, re-internalize all of my development? Should I externalize some of my development? Should I partner with other companies? Should I create new markets? How do I build capabilities? Um, so I don't think management and executives, they, are, they want to be in control more than adaptable. A lot of the executives that I speak with, they are looking for adaptability. But yes, they are also interested in some control. And okay. for them, processes is one, one way of putting in place control. But a better way, is, as I said, is, are these rules and, and governance. Does that, does that make sense? Yep. And because for, for interest of time, I've got another one bigger question. <laughs> okay, this bigger yeah. question, uh, we've got four minutes, uh, is towards the four last uh, slide that you have because you're yeah. going too fast that time. So I missed quite a bit. Uh, the four last slide you have with that governance, uh, infrastructure, DevOps, people, pulse, security, skills, and stuffing. So what does it mean? And then and the last slide, the last second slide, you put, how do we know? So I don't really get it. What, what are you trying to see? If maybe if you can open the slide, it'd be easier for people to see as well. Okay. The fourth slide and the second last slide. Okay, this one. This one, this one yes. Uh, this one and also the last one, the second last. This okay. slide, yes. What does it mean? What are you trying to see about this slide? And the last one with that, the dot, dot, dot. Yeah. So let, let's look at this, right? Mm -hmm. This this slide first. And um. This slide is about the fact that when you create your governance, so in a way, your rules, the question is, how do I create my rules? How do I create my, my rules? Around what? And the model that I'm showing here, but it's, it's not the purpose of this talk uh, to, to speak about how we do governance. The purpose was to tell you that governance is a better uh, solution. Uh, I can tell you more on that again on, on maybe a different webinar or uh, on one on one chat is that we define these domains around which I want to create governance. So for example, this is a domain that I suggest that all the companies that I work with inspect first, people, the people domain. So you are a company, you work with people. What kind of governance rules do you want to put in place so that you remain flexible, but also somehow in control? And if you want, we can do this exercise. Think of, for example, think of a rule, all of us. Let's think of a rule that you want to put in place to make sure that in terms of the people working in our company, if we respect the rule, we are not in a risk 
of immediate or obvious fail. So think of, think of a rule that you would like to have in your company respected so that you are, in a way, with less risk of immediate failure. What does immediate failure mean for people? That people leave, that people are unhappy, that people are not motivated, that they, I don't know, something like that. So who, who can tell me of a rule? And we will create this like this maturity model together. And after that, we will we will try to stop. So one rule around people that you would like to have in your company so that you reduce this risk. I think that they should be empowered first. Our people empowered. can take decisions and we know which decisions they can take. This could be a rule, right? I, I expanded the empower because that's, in my opinion, that's one of the definition of empower so that we understand. And um, that can be in all of our teams. It's clear for everyone what decisions they can make. You know, and everybody knows. Exactly, that's a rule. Um, I, I prefer this kind of rules because when you say people should be empowered, mm, so how do I do that? What does it mean? I try to, to give it a bit more context, but yeah, that's that would be a, a great rule. And if you don't have that, if people feel that they cannot take any decision, they will probably be leaving. So if you are in a way in a risk, of immediate and obvious failure. Now also think of a, of a, of a, of a rule that would be uh, around this. So from a, from a workforce point of view, how, what kind of rules do we need in place for us to be better than the industry? What, 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 what kind of rule do you think of when, when you think of that? Allow innovations. Right, so for example, um, we have um, enough bandwidth to support our most innovative ideas. And people can decide to group around certain innovations. Right, you know, maybe some years ago we were discussing about that. That, for example, in Valve, which is a, which is a game company, their people would look at what all the company was doing, and they could have said, "I want to work on that project because it feels interesting." So that can be a rule, and yeah, some companies might have these rules, and others no. I know that we are out of time, uh, and I know that some of you have to leave. I just wanted to say before that, that I thank you very much for being here. I will be staying 10 more minutes, but I know that some of you will have to, to leave. So um, I also wanted to give us a chance to, to, to say goodbye. Um, I really appreciate uh, you coming here and I do hope you, you learned something uh, interesting uh, from, uh, from this talk. Uh, and as I said, I will be staying more, no need to leave all of us now, but if you have to leave, uh, don't uh, don't don't worry, and I look forward to to your uh, to your feedback. Thank you. So if we look at this, that in a way is uh, coming back to that question. That that was what what was here and why this had this thing. Because when we when we do governance. We define some of the domains in which we want to do governance. And you see, these are domains like security or skills or testing or turnover, staffing, or and there are more. And this, uh, by the way, this slide, I didn't present it. I didn't speak about it. I think it's fine if we, if we just don't take into consideration. Yeah, no wonder I didn't catch it. Because okay, yeah, I yeah. didn't remember that. <laughs> okay, so that one, that dots one, the one I confused. Okay, you say that, how do we know this? So what is it? Uh, you say then, then you put structure. Yes, then you put structure. What do you mean by structure? Yeah, structure or governance. So I've been using these terms in gover. Oh, so it's governance. Okay, now I get it. Yeah. 
Yeah, I've been using these terms interchangeably because yeah, to some people, governance, as I said, have has a bad reputation, like government, like a lot of command and control, a lot of, uh, let's say, um, uh, hierarchy and this kind of stuff. But what I was speaking about here is not about that. It's not about a lot of command and control. I'm speaking about just enough structure for things to be uh, in, in, in the right balance. I'm not a big fan of, let's say, too much structure. And I was also saying that too many rules, it means you are no longer actually benefiting from, from that. And you also mentioned about the okay, so structure and this numbering. How do we read this number? Yes. Um, so this number 100 is the number of rules that we define together and we respect. 100% or 50% or 25%. And uh, what what uh, what we said there is that if you are respecting 25% of the of your rules, you are probably going to be facing some of the problems. Uh, if if not, it means that you didn't define the good rules. But if you have the good rules and also defining them is an iterative process, and if you are only respecting just half of your rules, then expect problems somehow. And that's what I was trying to say in that graph is that we see that there is a correlation between the rules that you respect and the risk that you are in, at least in our way of working, which I didn't um, I didn't present here uh, because um, yeah, I do hope that I will have the chance to, to do that later. So it means if I were and if I read it correctly, that that a uh, horizontal is what a, a passing mark or what? Uh, no, the level of risk. It goes from zero to four. Zero means no oh, risk. That's risk. No four risk. means you are in a big risk of oh, having so problems. Risk. risk then that's... the hundred percent is compliance. I guess. Yeah, I wouldn't uh, say compliance because okay. it moves into that 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 direction of command and control. But yeah, it's kind of like compliance issue. Yeah, respecting the rules. Yeah. Okay, got it. Thank you. Now exactly. clearer. <laughs> Thank you so much. It's really mind blowing. Some of the input that you gave, the example just now about the, uh, where are we going? To have, what we're going to happen to the coaches and the scrum master? It's like wow. Okay, never thought of that. Uh, and getting people to management, I'm start seeing it now. If with, with, with my own company right now as well. And I'm with Azomobi, by the way. Thank you. Thank you for sure. all your sharing. It was my pleasure. So is there any other questions? So if no, then, then uh, shall we say a goodbye and maybe we can join next time. So Andre, are you sharing something? <laughs> yes, um, I would be maybe giving you um, again the, 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 the board if you want to share it with people that yeah. participated. It was also here in chat and I will be sharing uh, through you also the uh, my LinkedIn. Feel free to connect. It would be a pleasure for me. I'm also putting it here in chat that we will make sure that this sure. yeah. <laughs> yeah, we do share your link in uh in the message so let that the people can connect back to us. So yeah, it's a good idea to include your handwriting notes and the slides that uh we're going to send out thank you email. And also the uh webinar recording will be available like after 48 hours. So yeah, feel free to to wait for us. <laughs> Am I too late for a quest quick question? Sure. Yeah, let's take one last question. <laughs> okay. So um, I was actually trying to churn out uh, things about agile culture. So what? So uh, one thing that's actually lingering in my mind is like, uh, what is the, what is the euphoria? What is the 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 ideal state of culture that an organization should be? Like what's yeah. the goal? 
Yeah, so I think yeah, that would be a a long uh, a long question. Uh, but that's fine. Maybe <laughs> we can <laughs> maybe we can connect and discuss it uh, discuss it together. Short answer is to me, culture is the way that the company is behaving. It's very linked to that. Yeah. Today, in this super dynamic environment where everything changes, we need a culture. So culture behavior that brings us closer to answer to this ever-changing world. So to that, I would say that agility, that's what it kind of tried to answer and at the, the start. How do we need to think and how do we need to behave to be able to adapt? Um, and in your company, you can have a culture around that, which is yeah, more adaptable or less adaptable. Uh, to me, it's definitely uh, clear that companies that support change and adaptability through the culture are the ones that are having better everything. People are happier. Um, uh, they are having better results. But yeah, let's take that maybe also offline. Uh, just me. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. And with that, we, 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 we end, right? Excellent. So I hope to see you, everybody, uh, uh, in the next time. I wish you a fantastic day. Jane, do you want to add something for the end? or? Is it yeah, I will just uh, say goodbye to the rest. And also thank you for your time and all the wonderful information. It's really gives us a different uh, point of view of thinking. So thank you so much, everyone, uh, for, for the time. So Andre, we also wish you to stay with us uh, for a while. So maybe... Uh, we can just say goodbye to the rest. Feel free to ask Thank yourself. Bye-bye. You.